What a great <coughs> truth. What a wonderful truth. All right, Genesis 18. This is, uh, we're going to read towards the end of the chapter. We're going to read Abraham's address to God after the Lord gives him the scary news that Sodom and Gomorrah is fixing to go down. And the Lord knows it does. Genesis 18, verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, you got to understand, Sodom and Gomorrah are big old cities in that area, and they affected the local economy. They affected the local everything, so, social life, everything. And if God goes and decides to tear up Sodom and Gomorrah, everything that everybody's used to anywhere around there is going to change. Amen. Hey, Americans, do you know we are right on the oh, edge yeah. of falling off? You don't make it when you're $35 trillion in debt. That's not sustainable. I'm not letting out any secrets. If you know any mathematics at all, you know that's not going to work. We have a sitting president with dementia, and we've got the one most likely to win the next presidential uh, race with a bullet through his ear. Do you know how close we are to total instability and disarray? When Abraham recognized just how close they were to things changing big time. You know what he did? He got with God. Let's read about it. Verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I'll tell you something, that took some courage to say that to God. Oh, man. That did. You're going to even slightly imply that he might do wrong? I don't know. Got to be his friend. Verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. <clears throat> will thou destroy the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. Abraham returned unto his place. I want to preach tonight Abraham's address to God. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you come down and bear witness to the truth of your word. And Lord, we, we sure need to get a hold of you. And we're in some real unstable times, and there is no telling what might happen in some of our personal lives and our family lives and our health and our finances. And I don't know everything, but it might really, really be affected. It might really be devastated by some of the events going on in our country and to a lesser extent, maybe even in our state and locality, I don't know what might be in the future. But I'm glad I know the one that holds the future, and that's you, Lord. And I pray we've learned some lessons from your friends speaking to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say tonight that God listens to his friends, and they influence <coughs> his decisions. You know what? When somebody is one of my friends, and they've been close to me, they took care of me at times that I really needed it. And they come to me and tell me they need something. If there is any way possible, I'm doing it their way. You know why? That's my friend. That's my family. They do. You know what? Our God is the same way. Amen. His decisions are influenced by his friends. The Bible says in James 2.23, Abraham was called the friend of God. 
Are you one of God's friends? You say, oh yeah, I got saved when I was a little child. I got baptized and I joined the church. That doesn't mean you're his friend. That doesn't mean your relationship is all that close to him. There are people sitting in church pews all over this country that barely talk to God this very day. If you've got a close friend around, wouldn't it be weird if you didn't speak to them and they didn't speak to you that day? There are plenty of people sitting in church pews that are not friends to God. Now, they, he saved them. They're going to heaven when they die. They're one of the redeemed. Praise the Lord. But them and the Lord aren't very close. How are you and Jesus doing? Did you talk to him today? Did he talk to you? Can you sing that song, And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Does it feel like you and God are alone, and does that happen more or less on a daily basis? I know what I want to be. I want to be a friend of God. Yes. And if I end up making everybody mad, the Lord knows I've come real close a few times. <laughs> Let it be said that, you know what? He stuck with the Lord Jesus. I may have a lot of wrong things wrong with me, and I do, but I'll say this. I want to be lined up as one of his friends. Amen. And I'll say this for myself. I can see where my prayers have influenced his decisions. Is it because I'm so good and godly? No. Is it because I'm so smart and powerful? No. I'll tell you why it is, because he befriended me one day, and I made him my friend, and there was nobody in this universe more important to me than him. Okay. Now, if Abraham was the friend of God and received the blessings that the Bible records, and let me tell you something, Abraham got the blessings. <coughs> oh, man, did he get the blessings. God help us to learn from his example so we can be described as the friend of God and we can get blessings like Abraham got. Now certainly the greatest of these blessings, more than Isaac, more than Jacob, more than the, the nation of Israel, and believe me, those are up there. Most of your Bible deals with that nation. The Lord talks way, way more about the descendants of Abraham than he does the Bible-believing Baptist in church today. And don't get me wrong, I love the Baptists. You see the pictures lining the wall. And you know how I love our Baptist heritage. Thank God for it. Amen. But let me tell you something. Abraham was God's friend. Yeah. In a way that few could ever be. You know what I want to be? I want to be close to the Lord like him. And even as Gentile dogs, you know what we're told? We're told that spiritually speaking, we can be children of Abraham in regard to our relationship to God. Paul brings that out. So today, let's examine this related blessing of God, listening to those close to him and allowing them to have input in his great works. Wow! You and I can have a part in God's great works. I've often told you about that time Brother Ron Brown was preaching his sermon, The Sin of the Silent Saint, and how it just knocked me down. And I jumped on the phone with my dad as soon as I got home that night and said, Man, you should have heard Brother Ron's message on prayer. He reminded me that I can talk to God and it actually affects him. I had actually gotten callous to the Lord and thought, well, if I pray something, it doesn't much mean anything anyway. So when I prayed it, I prayed it half-heartedly. And Dad said, yes, son, a four-year-old child can move the hand of providence. I felt so rebuked. But that's true. Too bad. Now, mainly, Abraham was known for being a man of faith. He believed God, did he not? Sir. The Bible says uh, the Lord brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Thank God for that great truth. You and I cannot keep the law of God, can we? I know. You and I cannot live up to the Pauline epistles. All those commands in the Pauline epistles for the church age. Anybody here ever kept all those perfectly? <laughs> of course not. Then how can we in the sight of a holy God be found righteous? He gave us away. He said this. He said, if you'll believe me, I'll count that for righteousness. That's a place for me to get in. I can believe him. Amen. Now that one I can do. I'm not keep the Old Testament law. I'm not going to live up to all the New Testament epistles. But I can believe God. Amen. And 
I can show it by the way I live. Now this is important because we too are unrighteous in trying to fellowship with the Holy God. But he will impute righteousness or for belief or faith in his word. Philippians 3, 9, Paul says this, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. You know what you have to do for God to impute some righteousness on your account? Believe him. Amen. I love that little children's song. Jesus, I believe what you said you'd do. Oh, is that our testimony? Now let's look at Abraham's address to God here. First of all, let's look at the God addressed. Abraham uh, knew he was talking to the God of the universe, the creator of the universe. Let me tell you about our God. He is infinitely, infinitely great. Jeremiah 23, verse 24 says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. When you have a chance to believe God, you have a chance to believe the God that fills heaven and earth. Wow. You have a chance to be close to that God. I don't care if you vote for Trump or not. You got a chance to be close to that God. I don't care if you're rich or not. I don't care if you're from my beloved South or not. I don't care if you hang out with friends of mine or not. You got a chance to be close to God. You got a chance for a blessing that nothing else can compare to. The one that fills heaven and earth. But more importantly than that, he's up there. Any historical figure you want to bring up. How about the great Nebuchadnezzar and that great Babylonian kingdom, empire? How about Medo-Persia and Belshazzar that took his, uh, lost his place, and here came King Darius and, ki and the rest of the Medo-Persian kings? How about the Romans and Caesar? How about Alexander the Great just before him? What if you had a chance to know these guys? Wouldn't you have some power? What if you were next door neighbors to the Rothschilds <laughs> and you were friends of theirs and your kids went to the birthday parties with their kids? <laughs> You'd have some power, wouldn't you? Amen. What if you get to be with the God that fills heaven and earth, whom angels and cherubim and seraphim cover their faces to worship him? That soars way past anybody oh, on planet yeah. Earth that you can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. Infinitely great. Here's another one. He is perfectly holy. The outstanding characteristic of God that outranks every other characteristic that he has is his holiness. You will not find God sinning not one little time. You won't find one imperfection in God. His holiness outranks every other thing about him. You know what? That's way different than us humans, isn't it? Amen. Isaiah 6, 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Revelation 4, 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There are beings up there in heaven way smarter than you and me, way more powerful than you and me, un unfathomable in our minds for how wonderful these beings are, and they're not sweeping the floor. They're not cleaning the sheets. You know what they're doing in heaven? Full time. They say, holy, 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 Amen. Lord God Almighty. That is their full time job, day and night. God's holiness is impressive. It is unbelievable. You know the God that we're serving? Number one, he fills heaven and earth. He is awesome Amen. in his magnitude. Amen. Number two, he is absolutely, spotlessly, sinlessly holy. Amen. Number three, he is all-powerful. Yeah. 
Revelation 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. <coughs> Everything that's here, He created, and it's created for Him and for His pleasure. There's not one thing here that doesn't answer to Him ultimately. He is infinitely great, perfectly holy, all-powerful, and then all-knowing as well as everywhere present. The theologians call it omniscient and omnipresent. Uh, let me read to you Psalm 139. If you want to follow along, you can, or I will just uh, read it to you. Psalm 139, a great chapter. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. It doesn't make any difference to God. You can't be lost from him. Amen. Wherever you go, he's there. Whatever you're doing, he sees. Whatever you're thinking, he knows. Amen. Good. This is the God you can know. The one that is infinitely great, perfectly holy, all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at the same time. Oh, and you can have a relationship with him. All you got to do is hit your knee. And for the children here, you can do it just as well as the adults. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you learn to read, you can read your Bible and he'll talk to you. What an amazing thing. No wonder the psalmist said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. <laughs> he couldn't even figure that out. Our God can be that big and yet that detailed. <laughs> and have his hand and his finger on every single one of us. That's the God address. Now let's look at the manner of the address. How did uh, Abraham talk to this incredible God? Number one, drawing near. Look at verse 23. And Abraham drew near. Amen. Let me tell you what the most important thing in your whole life is. One time I was watching, they were getting ready for the Tennessee football season, and Fulmer was the coach at the time. And he was coaching the running backs, trying to make sure they didn't fumble the ball. And he said, boys, now when you get that ball, the most important thing in your life is holding on to that ball. <laughs> oh, man, he had millions of dollars riding on it, you know. Let me tell you what's the most important thing in your life. This is more important than anything going on with your spouse, your kids, your money, your health, your country, or anything else. The most important thing in your life is your relationship to the God of this Bible. Amen. Let me tell you what the number one thing you better be concerned with before anything else Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. If you don't, it will have a devastating effect on your relationships and your money and your health and your happiness and your job and everything you got going. It will not be blessed by God. And when you do get so-called blessings from it, they will be blessings that do not satisfy and do not bring enjoyment. God is the one that giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Try the world's way. Try your flesh's way. You may say, look at the nice house I got. Look at the nice promotions that I have gotten. Look at my beautiful family. There are many people with those same things on some sort of dope trying to get the pain out of their head drunken, talking to a shrink, doing anything they can to try to find some peace and try to find some enjoyment. You know why? They got a bunch of things that they have no enjoyment with them. Amen. It's God that giveth us richly all things 
to enjoy. Yeah. You know the stories of the rock stars and the country stars and the movie stars and the and movers and shakers of this world and our celebrities. You know how miserable their personal lives are. You know how many of them sunk on something they can't quit and wish to God they could. You know how many of them are miserable. I will. I told you about that Phil I was witnessing to the other day at work. I, and he said he was depressed. I said, no, where are you depressed? You come in here smiling and joking all the time. He said, yeah, so did Robin Williams. Boy, that knocked me back right quick. I thought Robin Williams was a funny guy, so I thought soon he must be happy because he always made me laugh. No, he did. He committed suicide. The manner of the dress, you know what it is? Drawing near. Hey, are you and God close together? Ever, ever you left your room this morning, did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you sue for loving favor as your guide and stay? Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer can change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, make a little more money. <laughs> Find you a little better, sweetheart. So when life seems dark and dreary, have your favorite team win the ball game. <laughs> so when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. Amen. Amen. The manner of the address, number one, drawing near. Number two, fear. You read these, this passage, you know what I see from Abraham? Fear. Yeah. You can be close to God and still be a little scared of him. <laughs> when I was growing up, Dad and I were close. We enjoyed football together and talked history and politics and all kinds of things together and uh, Southern philosophy, but I was still a little bit scared of him. <laughs> I knew I had to do right or I was going to get punished. You can be that way with God. Abraham and God were friends. They were close. But he, he, he approached the Lord with some fear. He seems a little bit rambling, doesn't he? Seems a little bit nervous. Uh, well, I, I, I took up on me to answer uh, and, and ask God something. And, oh, don't be angry with me and I'll speak. And He showed some fear of God. You know, one of the great tools for you and the Lord getting close is you having some fear for him. Yes, I am not saying that that needs to be all of your relationship with him. Please do not misunderstand. But don't make it none of your relationship. It should be a significant part. Yes, sir. When you see an almighty, all-powerful, 100% holy God, and you see how weak and sinful you are approaching his throne, uh, I hide, I shield myself as I approach him. You know what my shield is? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dr. Amen. Ruckman used to teach us, you, you need to plead the blood. He sent some old-timers, taught him that when he was a young Christian. Right. Learn to plead the blood. Before you even come to that throne, say, Lord, I'm coming on the basis of the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ. That's what got us in. Amen. So number one, drawing near, but number two, fear. Number three, humility. He didn't say, well, now I'm Abraham, greatest and richest man around here. And, uh, <laughs> if the king of Sodom gets in a little trouble, I take my 300 trained servants, and we just go whoop them real good and get Lot and bring them back. And uh, I just turn down all the gifts they give me. I don't need anything else. I'm rich. Hmm. Is Abraham talking that way here in this passage? No. You ain't yet he stayed humble. Are you able to stay humble? Sometimes we get some answers from our Bible. Us Bible-believing Baptists, I know us real well. <laughs> and we get some answers from our Bible, and we can, we, can, we can debate well. We can prove our point from a verse of Scripture. And God knows I've done this some myself. Next thing you know, we get puffed up. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the New Testament warn us? <clears throat> Knowledge puffeth up. But charity edifies. Amen. Let me tell you how to stay real good and humble. Spend a little time with the God of the universe every day. It will remind you how small you are. He came humbly before God. Look at his word in verse 27. Look at his words. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. When was the last time you went to the store and bought some dust and ashes? Did you spend a lot of money for it? It's just not worth anything to anybody, is it? You know what Abraham had a good picture of in his mind as he approached God? His worth. He saw he was dust and ashes, especially up beside God. But I'll tell you another trick he teaches us here. I don't know if I should call it a trick, but it's a great tool, we'll say, in prayer. He appealed to God's characteristics. 
Look at verse 24. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Oh. You know what he did? He knew God was righteous. So you know what he started doing? Appealing to God's righteousness. When I know somebody real well, and I know there's something that they love, and I want to talk them into something, you know what I can do? I can appeal to the thing that I know is valuable to them. Let me tell you about our God. He prizes righteousness. I'll say something else about him. He's merciful. Verse 28, Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? He knew God was merciful. He knew if somebody comes pretty close, God ends up coming on to meet them halfway. You remember when the people weren't ready to observe the Passover at that first month? And so a bunch of them observed the Passover the second month. And you know what Hezekiah said? I mean, Was it Hezekiah that did the sundial? I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. Yeah. You know what Hezekiah prayed? He prayed, The good Lord pardon everyone that is not uh, sanctified to observe. Why? Because he knew the Lord was merciful. You know what Abraham's doing here? He's saying, now, Lord, if I just prayed for 50 and you agreed to that and they lack five and they've got 45, will you do it? And you know what the Lord did? Yeah, I'm, I won't destroy them for 45. You know what you can do when you pray to God and you get real close to Him? You get to where you know Him and you can appeal to That's Him a good on the things that He finds important. <coughs> now what if all you do is say, Lord, if you'll just do this, the stock market will soar and I'll have millions of dollars. Is that real important <laughs> to God? <laughs> you figure out what is important to your close friend. You pray based on that. He drew near to God. He feared God. He had humility with God. He appealed to God's characteristic. I'll tell you another one. He did it six times. He goes to him in verse 23. He goes to him in verse 27. He goes to him in verse 29. He goes to him in verse 30. He goes to him in verse 31. He goes to him in verse 32. Hey, when's the last time you wanted something so bad you went back to God over and over and over and over and over again in that short period of time? You know what the Lord Jesus said? He said that God rewards importunity. That means bugging him. As I've often said, my kids are a great example of this. They wear me out until I do something they want me to do for them. They ask for it again and again. But here lately, it's Virginia wanting boba tea. Dad, can I have boba tea? If you see the food truck that has the boba tea there, can you stop there? Oh, Dad, did you look for the boba tea while you were out? Did you try the, this parking lot and that parking lot? And I made a mistake. I told her, I saw the boba tea truck in Walmart the other day. Okay, boy, there we go. Now we had to find it. Now I finally found it in IGA, or priceless IGA today and got her something to find it. She doesn't have any problem with importunity. And mother kids, when they were her age, didn't have that much trouble with it either. They don't have much trouble with it even at the age they're at, most of them. Uh, go to God and go to him again and again. At first, if it was another human, I'd fuss at one of my kids and say, don't keep bugging them. But you know what? I can't say that about the Lord. Because Jesus invites us to in the Gospels. Does he not? Yes, Does he not tell us to? Yes, sir. Then have at it. Yes, you got the command of Jesus That's Christ. Good, All right, I'll tell you another thing I'll notice about this. Look at the character of those who address God this way. You say, it's the great Abraham. Well, <laughs> not, uh, not in his interaction with God. That's not what he says. The Lord doesn't say, you know, Abraham, father of my chosen people. <laughs> he doesn't talk to him that way. I heard the, the Smothers Brothers do a comedy routine one time. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about uh, George Washington when he was a little kid, you know, supposedly to cut down the cherry tree. And they were doing a comedy routine on that. And they said, here came George Washington's father. And he was a little boy there and said, George Washington, father of our country. Did you cut down that cherry tree? <laughs> well, you know what? At the time he cut down the cherry tree, if in fact he did, 
He was not yet father of our country, and he's still ready to just get a good, get a good whooping for uh, cutting down the cherry tree. Uh, Abraham, in relation to God, don't get me wrong, he's a friend of God, but he was able to take a humble place. And his, this is how he describes himself, and frankly, the Lord does not correct him. First of all, he says he is of lowly origin, because he says he's dust. Did God not create man out of the dust of the earth? <coughs> dust, is that very valuable to you? He says he's dust. I'll tell you something else. He's got sure mortality. Where God is living forever and ever, we die. You know what ashes are? Ashes are the leftovers when something's all burned up. Abraham describes himself to God as dust and ashes. Lowly origin, sure mortality, depravity. Something that maybe once was way more valuable. What if I took a, a beautiful piece of woodwork that was worth hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands of dollars, strike a match to the thing, all of a sudden it's nothing but ashes. It's worthless. That's the character of those who address God. You know what that tells me? I can get in. Amen. You think, well, I'm, I'm of lowly origin. I'm not from a big family. I'm not wealthy. I'm not a mover or shaker in my community. Yeah, but you can address God. Say, but I'm not worth anything. I'm not the great work of art that somebody else may be. I'm just ashes. I'm something that woulda, coulda, shoulda been bigger. But you can address God. You can get a hold of God. And you know what? He's concerned about your marriage. He's concerned about your vehicles. He's concerned about your job. He's concerned about your kids. He's concerned about your house. He's Amen. concerned about your church. He's concerned about your town, Amen. your county, your state, your country, and everything you got going. Get a hold of God. Amen. You've got plenty to talk to him about. Amen. And don't think that because you're not a preacher, don't think that because you haven't been saved for a certain number of years, don't think that because you don't know something or you don't have some power, you don't have some ability, and certainly not because you don't have any money, don't think that you can't get a hold of God. Amen. The character of those who address God can be very humble. And even Abraham suddenly gets him. Getting in the presence of God is a great equalizer. I will admit to you that Abraham seems very important in human history. But up beside God, not much there. Not much there. Now, in closing, let's look at the benefits of Abraham's address to God. Number one, and this is as good as any of them, he got the honor of worship and praise. Some might pass right by that. I need that money to pay that bill. I need my loved one healed. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me tell you who honors and praises God. The angels, way higher than me and you. The cherubim way higher than me and you. The seraphim, way higher than me and you. You want to move up and get on their level? Let me tell you what you do. Honor and praise God. And you just got a promotion. You just got involved in the occupation of people way higher, way smarter, way more powerful, way more holy than you ever dreamed of being. You go to the Lord in prayer and you worship and honor and praise Him and you just took on an angelic Occupation. Do not pass that one by. But number two, the relief of forgiveness of sins. Who can forgive sins but God only? Amen. The gospels say. You get a hold of God, you get a hold of the one that can forgive sins. <coughs> you know why a lot of people are miserable? And are trying to do anything they can to cover their sorrows and drink away their sorrows and distract their mind away from their sorrows yep. and stay busy and think about anything else but their sorrows and go to sleep with some noise going on so they don't have to think because they don't want to get alone with God Amen. when they're feeling guilty. You'd be surprised how that's messing up some people's psychology. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just Amen. to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There have been things I didn't even 
realize how guilty I felt about it. But when I took care of the thing, whoa, I just felt a big burden come off me. The Lord had been, just to give you an example of something in a, in a, in a spiritual ministry type thing, the Lord had been dealing with me for years about getting on the radio. By the way, I got a testimony just today of somebody that heard us on the radio and talked about the impact that's had. I hear that all the time. The Lord had been dealing with me about getting on the radio for years, but I just went, ain't got the money, too expensive, and just didn't. And just didn't, and just put it off, and put it off, and put it off, and put it off. And I wanted to. It wasn't that I didn't desire to. Just I thought, well, look at that big number. That scares me to death. Can't be the Lord's will. He doesn't want to spend money like that. But then some things changed around here, and we were able to do it. And just the day I found out we were going to be on there, something clicked inside me. There had been something that was gnawing at me, and it had happened to the point I was calloused at it, and I didn't even realize it. And I was crying and I was praising because I knew something that had been bothering me literally for years was just taken care of. Now let me tell you something. Most of you in here have probably had a time in your life, maybe some of you even right now, that there's something that's been gnawing at you and you know you're supposed to take care of it, but you just gave it a shrug shoulder like I did for years and said, oh well, I just can't. And the Lord just keeps sticking and sticking and you put up a callus around that thing. If you'll make that thing right with God, you'll be surprised at the burden that'll come off of you. You say, I don't feel any burden. And yeah, because you've been carrying it so long you got used to it. Mm -hmm. But when that thing comes off, you'll be surprised how good it'll feel. Amen. Benefits of the address, number one, the honor of worship and praise. That's what the angelic is. <coughs> Number two, the relief of forgiveness of sins. Number three, the peace of casting your cares upon him. That great passage, Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let me tell you a little thing about my own psychology. If I see something I can fix easily, I don't worry about it, I can fix it. <coughs> If I see something that is totally out of my hands and I can't fix it at all, I don't worry about it. That's totally out of my hands. But if there's something that I think I can probably fix and I can almost fix and I can't quite fix, but maybe if I did this just a little bit different than I could and then I beat myself up, maybe if I had just said that different or done that different, I would have been in. That wears me out. You remember when David was praying and wouldn't eat and was miserable praying for that little baby not to die. And then when they told him the baby died, he got up and ate and went home. They said, you are about to die worried about the baby. Now we tell you it has died and you're just moving on fine. He said, well, now there's nothing I can do. It's gone. I'll go to him. That's a good thing. But let me tell you this, in case you're at that stage where you're thinking there's just something you can do about it, best thing for you to do in many cases is just put that worry on the Lord. Casting all your care on Him for He careth for you. Without me, you can do nothing. As long as you think, now Lord, I don't need you on this one. I can probably do this one. <laughs> let, me, let me just work a little harder. Let me just be a little more careful. Let me just try a little more. Let me just spend a little more money. No, without me, you can do nothing. You need him to take the whole thing. The easy things, the intermediate things, <coughs> the hard things, give him the whole thing. Then last, the benefits of the address is the surety of his will being best. Now, Abraham was worried, and I'm sure that I know part of the reason that Abraham was so worried is because he loved Lot. That was his nephew. That's his kin. He was real close. Mm. And he was worried about Lot. And he wasn't quite so direct with the Lord. I think he was kind of fearful of him and thought, well, it'll mess up the whole economy and the whole social setup of everything. So I'll save Lot and I'll try to save this part of the country by getting God to save Sodom. But with God's result, Sodom was destroyed. But Lot got out. You know why? Because when those angels went to get Lot, they said, we can't do anything until you're out of here. 
That tells me somebody had told those angels, and who could it have been but God, don't you let Lot get touched. Even if you don't exactly word your prayers right, even if you don't exactly say, God save Lot, you're saying, God save Sodom. Why in the world would anybody want to do that? If you have a, an idea of the bigger picture, Sodom was not good for that society, I assure you. But even if you don't word it right, the Lord knows what it is that you're wanting. And he answers it accordingly. <coughs> the Holy Spirit does what? Groans, making intercession for us. With those groanings that cannot be uttered. That's the benefit of the address. You get the surety that God's will is best, and you put it on him. Now there's nothing else you can do. You tell me something you can do better than put something in the hands that can have made everything and can do anything. Is anything too hard for me? Tell me something you can do better than put them in the hands that there's nothing too hard for. Once you've done that, move on. Amen. Move on. It's not that I don't feel your pain. It's not that I haven't been a worry wart myself. It's just I'm trying to reason with you for a minute. What else can you do better than that? If you put it in the everlasting arms and the almighty hands, you've done everything you could. You've done more than anybody else can do. Then move on. All right, what have we seen tonight? We've seen God hearing his people's prayers. And it's an interesting study to look at the places where it says God heard people. The first case where it said God heard a human is when the lad Ishmael is heard and spared by God. You know, Ishmael isn't exactly a hero of the faith. Amen. But he called out to God and God heard him and spared him. If it'll work for Ishmael, it'll work for me, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> then God hearkened to both Leah and Rachel and gave them children. Then the Lord hearkened to Israel, and they defeated the Canaanites in Numbers 21. And the Lord hearkened to Moses and would not destroy Israel, even when he had said that he would. And the Lord hearkened to Joshua and held the sun and moon still to allow Israel to win a great victory. Can you imagine? God Almighty said we were going to defeat the Canaanites, but let Joshua have the part <laughs> of putting a stop to the sun and moon moving in the heaven. That's no small feat. You tell me a scientist that's worked out a way to do that. <laughs> what astronomer can make that happen? I mean, there's literally nobody at Cape Canaveral, NASA, or anywhere else that can make that happen. If we went and asked them to please do it to show us how cool they are, they would laugh at us if they even gave us the time of day. Joshua was able to do it. You know why? He put something in the almighty hands. The Lord hearkened to kings, praying for their people. And in Malachi, he hearkens to the people, <laughs> talking to one another that feared him, and wrote a book of remembrance of those that thought about him. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Sure. This brother talked about being in Dr. Ruckman's book, The Full Cup. Men talked about the mighty men of David. There's a book of remembrance of those that think about God. Amen. Is your name in that book? What a strange thing. Not all these were great saints, not by a long shot, but I'll tell them, I'll say this for them. They believed God was their deliverance and they called on him for help. Believe God, obey him, and call upon him. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Amen. The Lord invites in Psalm 50. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Is that the relationship you want? Study Amen. the friend of God, Abraham, and the way he went to his friend, the Lord God Almighty. Dear Heavenly Father,